Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for joining uh, another uh, weekly research conference here at the University of Ottawa Heart Institute and uh, the Ottawa region and uh, uh, friends from near and far. And uh, just a few logistics that uh, during the uh, lecture uh, today will feature uh, Professor Rob the Camp. Uh, if you have any questions, use the Q&A feature on the bottom of your screen, and uh, these will be answered uh, in turn uh, at the end of the lecture. Uh, you can also ask uh, live questions at the, the end of presentation. Use the uh, hand up feature uh, again on the bottom of the screen, and we'll be able to unmute you and invite you to um, pose your questions uh, directly. And if you have any technical issues, uh, please uh, uh, use the chat function and uh, Kelsey or uh, Allison will be able to help you to uh, get you uh, successfully um, engaged and connected. And before I introduce our esteemed uh, featured speaker today, I would like to make a couple announcements. And uh, one is that uh, over the weekend, uh, we learned the uh, sad, sad uh, passing of Dr. Adolfo de Bode, uh, who led the research here at the Heart Institute uh, more than two decades ago. And uh, Dr. Bode is truly an icon in uh, cardiovascular medicine and research. And his work on natriuretic peptides uh, really redefined the heart as an endocrine organ. This not only changed the fundamental concepts in cardiovascular physiology, but it had a direct uh, impact uh, in terms of uh, clinical care today, uh, in terms of the diagnostic tools that, that we use uh, for heart failure, such as NT-ProBNP, and more recently, uh, it provided a mechanism for one of the new treatments for heart failure, that's Secubitril Valsartan or uh, Entresto. And his work being recognized by the Gaidner Foundation. Uh, he's actually one of the very few Canadians who received this a great honor, which is equivalent to, to the Nobel uh, Prize. And uh, he's also uh, inductee uh, for the Medical Hall of Fame and the recipient of the Grand Prix Scientifique, Le Foulon de la Lande uh, par uh, l'Institut de France, and also Order of Canada amongst many, many other uh, awards. Uh, while we mourn his loss, uh, we celebrate his uh, impact and legacy. And uh, we are very proud, of course, of his uh, association with the Heart Institute, and we'll have a more formal memoriam uh, in the following days. Uh, another um, set of events over the weekend, of course, was the Canadian Cardiovascular Congress. Uh, many of the Heart Institute uh, members uh, participated actively in the program and also received um, uh, awards as well. And, but the particularly relevant uh, to today's uh, lecture uh, is this year's uh, Dr. Michael Freeman award given by the Canadian Society of Cardiovascular, Nuclear, and CT Imaging to Dr. Rob Binlands, uh, head of uh, Division of Cardiology here at the Heart Institute. Uh, this award recognized outstanding investigator uh, who's made the major contributions to the field, and uh, we offer our congratulations to Rob, but this is a perfect segue, uh, in fact, for our lecture today because it's a research partner and who's the other Rob, but uh, I will say even more important, Rob, Dr. Rob DeCamp uh, is our uh, speaker today. And uh, Dr. DeCamp uh, is the head uh, imaging physicist and also co-director of the preclinical imaging core of the Ottawa region, which is the P-Core, and the director of cardiovascular imaging research core laboratory or the Circle Lab at the University of Ottawa Heart Institute. He uh, uh, obtained his uh, BSc uh, in engineering at University of Waterloo, followed with the remote sensing and medical imaging uh, industry uh, stint. He completed the MC and the PhD uh, in electrical and computer engineering at uh, the uh, ES Garnett Department of Nuclear Medicine at the McMaster University. He then made the right decision and came to Ottawa in 1994 to help establish the very important National Cardiac Pest Center together with uh, Rob Beanlands at the Heart Institute. Uh, he is a presently uh, Associate Professor of Medicine and Engineering at the University of Ottawa, and also Adjunct Professor of Science 
uh, engineering uh, at the Carleton University and past director of the Ottawa Medical Physics uh, Institute. And uh, he's uh, served uh, many roles in the international bodies, including the Cardiovascular Council of the Society of Nuclear Medicine, Associate Editor of Circulation Cardiovascular Imaging, and currently on the editorial board of Journal of Nuclear Cardiology. And he's the past chair of the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology Technical Committee, and also the PET uh, Quality Assurance Committee uh, for the entire province of Ontario. And his uh, research really is uh, really cutting edge in the uh, field in terms of uh, developing quantitative imaging biomarkers for cardiac uh, positron emission tomography or PET. And uh, he, uh, I think, uh, is uh, particularly also um, noted for many of his uh, innovations and inventions. So he developed the Rubidium 82 uh, generator, an illusion system. Uh, which is being approved by the EMA and FDA, uh, licensed to Draxon Image and now marketed all over the world. Uh, his novel uh, myocardial uh, blood flow imaging analysis method, the FlowQuant, uh, is uh, installed in uh, uh, imager uh, anal uh, analyzing uh, stations uh, worldwide. And uh, this is a tool we use every day in our reporting. His analysis method for quantitation of myocardial metabolism and cell signaling is also um, clinical and the industry standard. And so we're really fortunate to have him here at the Heart Institute most recently. His talents have been recognized by the Herman Blogart uh, Award uh, through the um, uh, Cardiovascular Council of the Society of Nuclear Medicine. And this really uh, is uh, given by the board of directors to recognize someone who's made uh, really seminal contributions to the field worldwide. And I think he's most deserving of this recognition. And I think it's really through his uh, leadership that we're fortunate to receive uh, many CFI awards and uh, currently installing the preclinical PET as well as uh, uh, personal efforts in commissioning our new uh, clinical uh, PET uh, CT cameras, you know, two brand new uh, units, which we enjoy every day and for the benefit of our patients. And so it's really uh, no one more fitted to give us a really exciting futuristic look uh, in uh, applying AI and machine learning to image analysis. This title uh, of this lecture today is the AI digital pet revolution, turning unclear medicine to newly clear imaging. Uh, thanks so much, Rob, and uh, really appreciate uh, uh, you're a fantastic work uh, here at the Heart Institute. Okay, thank you so much, Peter, for the, uh, the very Sorry. kind um, introduction. Sad to hear about um, Dr. DeBold, who is really a pioneer. Um, and also my congrats to um, uh, Dr. Beanlands for uh, another well-deserved award. Um, so I thought I would uh, focus my talk today um, on uh, some of the new technology. Um, that we've um, recently acquired and uh, also used some of my slides from the kind of Bloomgard Award to kind of show um, some of the challenges that we've had uh, along the way, uh, and I think will help to put um, the capabilities of these uh, new technologies in, in perspective. In the past, um, nuclear medicine um, imaging was sometimes called uh, the pun unclear instead of nuclear imaging, um, and hence the kind of pun um, on the on the left is actually an image. Um, let's see if this will advance uh, of the recently uh, first imaged black hole, uh, which kind of looked like a, a little blurry nuclear medicine image um, to some of us. Um, it's recently been upgraded with some uh, polarized light to give it, you know, some uh, improvements. Uh, and uh, compared to those on the right, which is uh, a rubidium pet image from a few years ago. Um, uh, sorry, FTG. Um, our new technology is uh, really revolutionizing and giving us uh, a much clearer picture uh, of perfusion and metabolism and, and cell signaling. Uh, here are my disclosures um, for the record. Uh, the current cardiovascular pet indications, um, you know, I think we can, try, we can uh, divide into three categories. One is, is coronary disease um, and, and more recently, more and more use for imaging transplant vasculopathy. This is really based around perfusion and flow quantification. 
um, FDG for mild cardioviability. This is, you know, in patients who have um, more severe disease, LV dysfunction, and, and uh, physicians are trying to stratify between maybe a, another bypass surgery versus uh, transplant at this option. So very clinically valuable. Uh, and most recently, um, use of FTG whole body imaging for uh, various inflammatory diseases such as sarcoid um, or device infection, cardio uh, myocarditis, neurotitis, uh, and so on. Uh, and the technology used um, <clears throat> to do this imaging has really uh, not changed for uh, quite a long time. A brief review, um, kind of basic physics. I am a, a physicist as well as an engineer. So um, you may recall that uh, the basis of PET imaging is um, some isotopes decay by emission of a positron where proton is converted into a neutron in the nucleus and the positive charge comes out in the form of a positron, which is really the, the antimatter equivalent of an electron, positively charged electron. These combine and mass is converted into energy uh, according to uh, an equation discovered by this guy um, almost 100 years ago. Um, this is a real application, uh, medical imaging application of um, antimatter. And <clears throat> the way that uh, scanner works, uh, at least in the general way, um, is that it um, is set up with instrumentation to detect this pair of uh, collinear and so-called coincident photons. So that means that they arrive at a pair of detectors at the same time. And we set up what's called a coincidence detector, which seems like uh, a bit of a misnomer. It's, it's not something you know set up to detect the flip of a coin. Um, it's set up to detect pairs of photons uh, arriving at the same time. Um, there are you know, a few variations of these different kinds of photons, which I've spoken about in the past, but uh, suffice it to say that with uh, some knowledge of the basic physics, uh, PET imaging can quantify uh, the concentration of isotope inside the living body. So as I mentioned, um, PET detectors of early uh, design has not changed for quite a long time. Um, there are two important components. One is a scintillator, which is a, a high density uh, material that can absorb high energy photons. Uh, and coupled with uh, what's called a photomultiplier, we arrange a number of these typically in a ring around the patient uh, to perform this coincidence detection and imagery construction of the tracer distribution. So looking at these um, you know, what we call a block detector. Uh, this has really had not changed for about 40 years. Um, the scintillator or scintillation detector, um, sometimes divided into some smaller units and coupled with uh, these photomultiplier tubes, which are fairly large and kind of bulky um, creatures. And this really limited um, the size uh, to which each of these individual detector elements could be uh, cut. And you know, for a long time, these were on the order of a few millimeters, kind of six to eight millimeters. And that really determines the um, spatial resolution of, of PET images um, for many years. Here's actually what uh, kind of a mock-up of what one of these things would look like. A photomultiplier tube is literally um, a glass vacuum tube uh, with a set of uh, anodes and dynodes, uh, the purpose of which is to um, absorb the visible light that's produced by the scintillator um, and amplify it uh, into an electrical signal uh, that can be read out um, at, a per at a particular uh, position uh, and at a particular voltage uh, corresponding to the energy that was absorbed. But it's really remarkable to me that, um, you know, 40 or, or 30 years after um, vacuum tubes have disappeared out of commercial electronics, they still had been used in state-of-the-art imaging equipment. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a nice figure of uh, kind of uh, progression of uh, PET uh, count rate sensitivity. This is kind of a physics uh, index, you know, over the course of about 15 years, uh, published by John Moody in Michigan. Uh, when we started, um, as uh, Dr. Liu mentioned, 1995, shortly after I came, uh, the Institute invested um, you know, some money, uh, there was enough money not to buy only a partial ring uh, of detectors. And this was a relatively uh, new idea that helped us to get started um, in this business. Um, the first uh, uh, installation we can see uh, Dr. Beanlands and Dr. Ruddy 
Ross Davies, uh, the nurses and technologists, May uh, and Mary, who are here, uh, as well as myself at that time. And, um, you know, the three initials, um, Ruddy Bean Lance to Kemp, you know, came together. I should have known it was my destiny uh, to be working with uh, a tracer called Rubidium, which has formed um, the basis of much of my research for the past 20 years. Uh, we had a uh, radio pharmacist uh, who helped us and, and Dr. Beanlands uh, made a connection with a physicist in uh, Vancouver um, who had some technology to build generators and we brought this uh, to Ottawa, built our own generators and injector uh, and uh, started a rubidium imaging program uh, in 1997 because there was no uh, cyclotron here yet to make uh, the short-lived isotopes that are typically required for a PET. And this is what spatial resolution uh, looked like, um, you know, 95, 2000s, even up to uh, 2010. Um, rubidium pictures on the bottom uh, from the generator. FDG, uh, which we shipped from uh, Montreal or Hamilton for many years. And, uh, you know, if you look at the um, uh, lateral wall here, um, if you squint really hard, for those of us that, uh, that know Seinfeld, here's George trying to see, you know, a faint, uh, perfusion defect that's got FTG excess and this um, so-called perfusion and metabolism mismatch is an indicator of, of hibernating myocardium, uh, which formed the basis of our program initially. Christian Weifels um, uh, recently wrote a, or a nice review paper on this. Um, here we see when you add color, it can kind of help to point out uh, the differences a little bit more. We have, you know, red is maximum green and blue are minimum. So we have kind of a green perfusion defect here with maintained FTG. Uh, and this shows us that there's a mismatch or hibernating myocardium in this area uh, compared to uh, the opposite case where there's a reduction in perfusion here in the septum and matched uh, metabolism defect. This tissue has already uh, irreversibly remodeled into fibrotic scar tissue and, and will not recover function uh, even if it's revascularized. Uh, and Dr. Beanlands, of course, uh, published the seminal um, uh, RCT trials on the, on the PAR studies, uh, which are now cited uh, and used widely uh, to direct revascularization. My own early interest, uh, as I mentioned, was in blood flow quantification. We were fortunate to, uh, to hire this um, brilliant mathematician, Mireille Lorty, uh, and develop methods for blood flow quantification um, using rubidium, which at the time was you know, really considered a, a kind of second class tracer and one that would not be suitable for blood flow quantification. Uh, Dr. Beanlands, uh, uh, again, intimately uh, involved. Uh, we started to be able to attract international fellows. This is uh, Kichiro Yoshinaga, who, who also sadly um, passed away last year. Um, we developed software, uh, which Dr. Liu mentioned called FlowQuant. Um, this was a, a tool that we actually use for all of our research studies, but uh, clinically it's become uh, a workhorse for blood flow quantification. Uh, really the, uh, the brainchild of uh, Ron Klein, who's now a nuclear med physicist uh, at the Ottawa Hospital, and Jennifer Renault, who's uh, moved on to uh, industry working for India, who makes the um, 40M uh, clinical interpretation software. So with these uh, uh, early experiences and, and uh, improving reputation and, and uh, achievements in, in nuclear cardiology in Canada, we managed to, uh, again, under Rob Beanland's leadership, uh, secure uh, a substantial CFI uh, grant to uh, buy a cyclotron and install uh, a current state-of-the-art at the time uh, PET-CT scanner. We uh, started with uh, a discovery, a GE Discovery RX, and then uh, later upgraded to a 690. And what this gave us was um, really um, CT, accurate attenuation correction with co-registered CT. So we see the CT scan, uh, X-ray CT in, in gray uh, with soft tissue and the lungs in black uh, and the PET data uh, in color uh, superimposed here. But really, um, albeit this uh, advancement, which was really um, honestly directed towards oncology imaging, PET resolution, you know, really was still not uh, substantially improved, still around 10 millimeters. The scanner gave us um, capabilities for what's called list mode imaging. Um, so from a single injection, uh, we record all of the raw data and then can replay that data in a kind of simulated acquisition to get 
static images, uh, ECG gated images at, in diastole and in systole to measure LV volumes. Uh, but um, more importantly for my interests was uh, the ability to get from the same injection uh, a dynamic image series following the trace distribution from the time of injection uh, and using the FlowQuant software uh, to estimate um, or quantify myocardial blood flow in, in absolute units of mils per minute per gram. And this is the um, kind of uh, clinician display um, that we've used for uh, many years and following installation of this scanner uh, from 2007 to date, uh, we've been able to uh, quantify uh, blood flow uh, like this, measuring flow at rest, at stress, uh, the ratio and the difference, uh, helping to identify regions uh, without um, sufficient uh, vasodilatory uh, capacity. Uh, and of course, because of clinicians like uh, to use thresholds, uh, we you know set up a color scale so that uh, you know at least on the stress reserve and delta, you know blue is bad, and that helps uh, uh, to provide some standardization of uh, interpretation of normal and abnormal for this kind of new type of data. Here's the raw data that's used um, to quantify flow. We scan from the time of tracer injection, and we follow the distribution through the right ventricle, the left ventricle, and finally the tracers trapped in the LV. Particularly at the early times, uh, the count rates can be very high. Uh, and it became apparent uh, that even with this um, current state of the art machine, that there were some um, what we call limitations in dynamic range uh, of what's now called, um, or often referred to as analog PET or PET using these photomultiplier tubes. When uh, these would correspond to a kind of bias corresponding with the amount of injected activity and um, uh, the first generation scanner, the Discovery RX, you know, we were limited to about 10 millicuries injected or 300 megabecquerels to get accurate blood flow quantification. With the 690, we could almost double that to about 20 millicuries injected. Uh, but there are still patients um, where we may be compromising image quality um, for the ability to quantify flow. Uh, and this trade-off still uh, existed uh, in the age of uh, analog PET. Um, and of course, again, the idea is to be able to increase this activity so that we're not compromising perfusion image quality at the expense of flow quantification. The scanner came with um, also what's called time of flight. Um, this was uh, a lot of hype uh, in the um, you know, 2005 to 10. Um, the concept is that when you have a um, positron annihilation that's a little bit off center, uh, it takes a bit less time for it to reach one detector versus the next. And if we measure the difference uh, in the arrival times, say here something like six centimeters is a time difference of about 0.4 nanoseconds, we can use that information to kind of position the counts, uh, you know, a little bit more to the right in this case, instead of simply, you know, um, populating the whole image array without time of flight. All we know is that the decay occurred somewhere along, anywhere along this line. With time of flight, we can at least give it, you know, a little bit of a uh, added position information. And this helps to reduce noise in our reconstructed images. At the time of the scanner, the resolution or our, our ability to measure that difference, um, you know, translated to about nine centimeters, which is, which is not great uh, for a 60 centimeter ring, but it was enough to um, help improve some image resolution um, somewhat. There was some clinical benefit observed, for example, whole body imaging. You could see that some of these uh, small lesions in the chest here are a little bit more conspicuous when you add time of flight, kind of uh, what I call first generation or 1G uh, activity in the bones, uh, a little bit more visible, um, probably indirect uh, improvement with scatter correction. But really there were um, disappointingly only marginal benefits, honestly, for cardiac imaging applications. We also started to investigate uh, respiratory motion and it became apparent um, that uh, with the image quality, uh, improved image quality that we had with the PET-CT scanners, some of the defects that were being observed um, were potentially uh, caused by uh, this motion of the PET images 
compared to the static uh, CT that was used for uh, attenuation correction. What we could do in this case was simply freeze um, the motion of the heart uh, to a position that was you know, well aligned with the CT. Um, disadvantage being um, that we only are using a subset of the counts. The image quality uh, was um, reduced. So I'm going through these things and I will come back to them, uh, each of these when you uh, address with some of the new technology. We published a case report, um, you know, showing these kind of appearance of these uh, opposing wall anterior and inferior defects. And simply by selecting, you know, an end expiration phase that was matched with CT uh, in cases where there was substantial respiratory motion, at least we could salvage the study uh, and uh, interpret in this case, um, normal or low risk um, kind of first generation respiratory motion correction. Chad Hunter, uh, and with some collaborations with Ron Klein and uh, Luca Persotto in, in Italy, um, brought to our attention this concept of PET reconstruction, not only of the activity distribution, but of the attenuation distribution. Uh, and this can be done in theory, uh, but in practice, you need time of flight uh, information for this method to converge reliably. Uh, and Chad was able to um, develop a prototype of this for rubidium imaging. Here you see uh, the transmission image kind of moving, the diaphragm moving up and down. It's a little bit noisy, uh, but we can now superimpose on top of it uh, the moving PET distribution uh, and avoid this kind of brightening artifact that happens when the PET image is uh, misregistered with the CT. So um, fast forward um, <clears throat> about uh, 12 to 13 years. Um, uh, we uh, had a lot of effort uh, developing rubidium um, from a clinical research tool um, into a tool that uh, now has uh, established clinical guidelines that um, we've contributed to. Uh, and importantly, in 2018, uh, had insured service uh, finally approved for rubidium in addition to some support for the generators. Um, uh, this was a huge undertaking. Um, that was facilitated by um, uh, Rob Beanlands and my uh, uh, interactions with Ontario Pet Steering Committee uh, and really by uh, uh, Rob Beanlands' uh, elegant uh, political navigation. And importantly, uh, with the clinical recognition of this um, CCO, uh, which manages the fleet of PET CT scanners in Ontario, mostly for oncology, obviously. Um, but also had a budget uh, and support for cardiac imaging indications. Uh, and uh, in 2019, uh, the stars aligned. Uh, we had two old systems at that time and a brand new imaging uh, center, which was ready uh, to receive uh, replacements. And we're fortunate uh, to receive funding for that um, replacement. So going back to our progressive uh, improvement in scanner sensitivity over time, um, we have now 2020 um, approval and installation uh, of uh, a Siemens Biograph Vision. Um, before this, uh, I should go back uh, one slide around um, kind of early 2010s to 2015 uh, was the new digital uh, technology, which started to uh, become integrated into the commercial systems. Philips was the first with Varios, then GE. Uh, and instead of photomultiplier tubes, we uh, or the vendors started to uh, manufacture the systems with what's called a silicon photomultiplier. And uh, Siemens was a little bit honestly late to the game, but when they came out with the machine, um, it has the highest uh, sensitivity uh, and imaging performance of any of the systems uh, currently on the market. So what is the difference? Um, here's another kind of view of uh, kind of what we call now analog setup, a scintillation detector with photomultiplier tubes coupled to the bottom of it. Uh, and we got many large photomultiplier tubes shown here as a circle snapping to, you know, a number of small detector elements. With the silicon photomultipliers, we have now direct uh, interaction of the visible light photons that are being produced in the scintillation detector with uh, silicone um, microcells, uh, each 
visible photon um, will interact with one of these micro microcells and, and trigger uh, an individual count, each of these tens of thousands operating in, in Geiger mode uh, and tens of thousands of photons being produced. Um, and so this is a uh, tremendous improvement. Um, the quantum efficiency, um, the transfer of visible photons to um, the digital electronics is about three times higher uh, with silicon photomultipliers and also allows these detectors uh, to be cut smaller than they could um, when they're coupled with the PMTs. The advantage um, of these uh, smaller detectors and more counting channels um, is that we have less uh, uh, what we call detector dead time. So less multiplexing, um, you know, when one of those large photomultipliers uh, fired, uh, there was a large area of the detector block that would be kind of dead until that uh, count was finished processing. Whereas now we have, you know, massively parallel processing uh, of counts in many independent channels. And this reduces the, the detector dead time and allows us uh, potentially to um, get more counts uh, for a particular injection uh, of uh, tracer activity. Here's another view. Uh, uh, this is the difference between the uh, old Siemens uh, photomultiplier-based detector and the new digital detector with direct coupling uh, of these silicon photomultipliers. Uh, so we've gone now from something like um, eight millimeters, there were some improvements down to you know, four to six millimeters, now down to three millimeter detectors. Um, and if we look at the resolution as a, a function of the square face, of this, you've got something like seven times improvement um, in, you know, X, Y or image uh, resolution. Not only better image resolution, uh, because of the uh, improved efficiency of the light collection, um, the time of flight um, resolution also improved. Here we see uh, time of flight resolution on our old GE scanner, around 600 picoseconds. That's good enough to localize, recall, to about nine centimeters. Uh, with the new vision, uh, has about 200 uh, picoseconds time resolution. So three times better. We can now <coughs> resolve uh, the position of those photons to within about uh, three centimeters. Uh, the axial field of view is also longer. We have a two times uh, you know, geometric sensitivity. Combined together, we have uh, six times improvement uh, in uh, count rate sensitivity. And here's a, another kind of physics way of showing um, uh, count rate sensitivities, uh, this uh, count rate index uh, that relates to, to um, sensitivity as a function of the amount of activity uh, injected into the patient. So uh, here's a vision as it compares to the other scanners. Uh, it's actually got the highest geometric sensitivity. When you combine that with uh, the benefits from time of flight, um, you know, the vision is really uh, head and shoulders above uh, all of the other uh, competing systems. So remember uh, where we started, um, you know, so-called analog pet, where we had to kind of squint to see these uh, subtle differences um, resolution around 10 millimeters. Uh, here is the kind of resolution that we achieve today. Uh, again, we have CT uh, in gray, PET images in color, uh, and the fusion images uh, superimposed on the right. You can see now uh, tremendous uh, improved contrast resolution, so very black backgrounds. Um, we can see often, uh, this is an FTG study, uh, papillary muscles, anterior, posterior, uh, right ventricle myocardium is, is uh, almost always uh, clearly visible. Uh, even the thin walls of the left atrium, uh, the right ventricle and the right atrial walls um, uh, often uh, well visualized. Uh, and so this has um, you know, really opened uh, a new window into uh, more confident diagnosis and potentially new uh, cardiovascular indications looking at these, these smaller structures. So here again is our, uh, our George Costanza. It's almost like uh, he's gotten a new pair of glasses and uh, you know, he's seeing clearly. Not only image quality, um, our image resolution has improved. Um, I mentioned that 
uh, previously there were limitations in dynamic range, right? When we injected um, more activity, particularly for um, obese patients, uh, we would typically like to be able to inject more activity for those patients to help maintain image quality. Uh, and some previous work with whole body imaging uh, showed that, you know, as patient weight increases, uh, image quality really decreases as a, as a squared function. So in theory, um, to maintain image quality, you know, independent to get the same image quality in the largest versus the smallest patients, we really should be injecting dose as a squared function of body weight. Um, and uh, this is some work that uh, Anna Tavusi, uh, one of our uh, fellows, has been helping uh, to investigate. Um, for many years, we've used dose as a linear function of weight, at least to try and help mitigate somewhat. Uh, but that was the best we could do with the previous generation. Uh, on the new system, we've switched to uh, what's called quadratic dosing. Um, here, in a small patient, uh, only 2.7 millicuries injected, and we have equivalent image quality. Uh, in a very small patient, in a very large patient, we need to give, you know, lots of activity, uh, 60 millicuries in this 150 kilogram patient. Um, and it seems that, um, you know, comparing image qualities, so signal to noise versus patient body weight in the past with linear dosing, you know, larger patients would have lower image quality with the new quadratic dosing regimen. You know, we have really uh, flattened that curve uh, and, uh, patients now, uh, even the largest patients, uh, should have the same image quality uh, as the smallest patients. We're, in essence, saving the dose uh, in our population from the small patients and shifting that over really to the largest patients uh, who need that high dose to maintain image quality. Um, we uh, hope to start a quality um, improvement initiative where we can uh, implement this you know, even for the patients above 150 kilograms uh, with the help of, uh, of Draxamash. We've been looking uh, more and more at uh, the effects of motion. So I talked uh, briefly about uh, the issues with respiratory motion and we had a, you know, first generation method to try and uh, correct for patient respiratory motion. Uh, there are other forms of motion as well. Um, patient movement, uh, in perfusion imaging, um, as well as dynamic flow quantification. And here's an extreme case, for example, with uh, a lot of respiratory motion. And uh, this image was completely non-diagnostic. You can see the perfusion images had complete blurring of the anterior and posterior walls. Um, with respiratory gating, uh, we could freeze that motion uh, as we did previously, but the new system, because of the higher sensitivity, uh, and more advanced um, image reconstruction, actually motion compensated image reconstruction, um, can now freeze the motion of the heart um, using all the counts um, and salvage, you know, the quality of the scan uh, to be uh, almost as good as a, as a scan, you know, with no patient motion at all. We um, submitted this recently as a case report um, and not only can we salvage the perfusion images? Um, but because of the very high time of flight resolution, remember 200 picoseconds, we can resolve the heart uh, even without image reconstruction. Just looking at the projection data uh, in what um, this work with Siemens has been called a, a direct volume histogram, we can localize uh, the heart uh, in the raw data and visualize that motion. Um, remove this uh, motion in the Z direction or the axial, you know, head to toe direction uh, before image reconstruction. And what this amounts to is uh, allowing us also um, to remove respiratory motion and uh, some patient body motion that also occurs um, typically in the head to toe direction and move from these completely blurred images to images that are sharp and can also be quantified uh, in terms of um, uh, mils per minute per gram. So you can see here um, before correction, very apparently heterogeneous flow with reduced uh, maximum flow. After correction, we have something that looks uh, more homogeneous, consistent with a normal scan and a normal quantitative flow response around 2.5. Uh, 
Um, so we hope that uh, this is still in the prototype development stage, um, that this will uh, become clinically for, available for our patients in the near future. So digital PET, um, I think is adding uh, a lot of improvements, improved spatial resolution, improved sensitivity, um, and improved dynamic range. Uh, and these are allowing us maybe to uh, add uh, emerging indications for microvascular myocardial diseases, uh, ischemic or non-ischemic cardiomyopathies like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where we may be able to resolve, for example, the endo versus epicardial flow, non-obstructive athro, the, the so-called NOCAs, INOCA, ANOCA, MINOCA, fiability imaging, uh, we'll be able to look at the, the thinner RV uh, and even uh, probably atrial metabolism, maybe not atrial perfusion, but certainly atrial innervation, which we started to investigate uh, with our EP colleagues. Um, and, you know, valvular and vascular remodeling uh, diseases um, using new tracers such as sodium fluoride, uh, which is an agent, uh, a tracer imaging uh, microcalcification. So, um, for those who are interested in some of these emerging applications, um, please let us know if you have ideas where you want to look at uh, molecular imaging in small structures. We may be at the point now um, where we can start to um, develop those clinical applications. So that is uh, <coughs> the um, digital PET portion of the talk. I, uh, I put AI at the start of the presentation to try and uh, entice uh, some of you to try and uh, hopefully join. Uh, and so I'll give a little bit of a summary of some of our work um, in the AI field. So <clears throat> this is a, a figure, a couple of figures taken from this nice review by um, James Min in the European Heart Journal um, a couple of years ago. And AI, you know, it generally refers to a large class of algorithms that um, is uh, aimed at, you know, taking measurements, uh, putting them through some um, processing algorithms and making predictions such as um, classification. So our classification might be normal, abnormal, uh, might be scar or ischemia, it might be high risk or low risk. Uh, image segmentation, you know, identifying different portions, RV, LV, atria, for example natural language processing, taking reports and trying to abstract the data out of those, um, you know, clinical reports, for example, that may have been dictated with variable vocabulary and uh, grammar. Uh, and uh, interestingly, image denoising, um, which uh, I'll show you an amazing application at the end. So in general, you know, the concept of, of AI is highly dependent on um, model training or model development and training. Um, we have several elements, typically a data set, which includes, you know, our measurements, which are, you know, our input data, and it should produce our predictions or our output data, which might be, in our case, diagnosis or prognostic um, uh, uh, outputs. We use this data and divide it into uh, training and test sets. Um, and use a procedure called cross-validation where we kind of mix and match uh, training and testing sets to optimize uh, parameters of the model. Um, and once the model is established, uh, good practice is to then evaluate it on a completely independent test set that was not used uh, to train the model parameters. There are <clears throat> a number of, uh, of different AI model categories. Um, and you know, I think of AI as a, as a combination of, of sing, signal processing and, and numerical optimization. Um, there are numerical methods, for example, even some of the you know, what would be considered traditional um, uh, fitting methods uh, could be considered AI, multilinear regressions, principal component analysis for you know, diagnostic applications, for prognostic applications, multivariable log logistic regression or uh, more advanced lasso uh, logistic regressions um, could be considered you know AI in the most general sense. There is a class of machine learning um, algorithms. Um, so one of the more simpler would be a kind of clustering algorithm where you know we look for uh, data elements or combinations of 
variables with similar values and we kind of group those together into different clusters. Um, another approach to grouping is called the support vector machine where we focus more on the boundaries um, between the different um, parameter values. And, and here's a simple linear um, uh, discriminator, but the discriminators can have you know, arbitrary shapes in arbitrary dimensions. It's a very powerful technique. Uh, random forest trees, so we can take our, our inputs and kind of uh, connect them in trees with different numbers of branches and levels uh, and leaves per branch. Uh, and these are kind of some of the, the parameters of the random forest that can be optimized to, uh, in the end, you know, predict our, our output of either, you know, healthy or unhealthy or high risk and low risk, for example. And then uh, the other main class is uh, deep learning algorithms. Um, uh, these are uh, some of the common ones are called a multi-layer perceptron, which is really just a, uh, called kind of shallow learning, maybe an input layer and one or more hidden layers uh, coupled with an output layer, uh, or a, a convolutional neural network, which might have, you know, many, many hidden layers uh, and be fully connected of every input with every uh, node in the hidden layers uh, to perform, um, you know, data abstraction. And uh, the idea is that the weights of each of these connections becomes um, progressively uh, optimized or weighted uh, to be able to predict the output as a combination, uh, a linear combination of the inputs. Um, really in our field in nuclear cardiology, um, Piotr Slomka at Cedars Sinai has been the, the leader in this area. Ashok, um, uh, in fact, two figures uh, from two different uh, journal articles, amazingly, in, in Jack CVI. Um, they've shown, for example, that a deep learning algorithm can improve um, the diagnosis of uh, obstructive coronary art artery disease using invasive angio as their training standard. Uh, and deep learning uh, achieves a better uh, ROC area compared to uh, standard um, perfusion quantification, what they call the, the total perfusion defect, um, you know, a benefit of, uh, let's say, 5% uh, in terms of sensitivity uh, at the same value of specificity. In terms of prognosis, uh, they've also used similar methods, in this case, a machine learning approach um, to show that um, you can predict uh, the risk of future uh, major adverse cardiac events like death or heart attack or emergency hospitalization uh, more accurately using a machine learning approach uh, analysis of the perfusion data, again, rather than uh, looking at just the conventional um, stress perfusion distribution. One of the, despite the, the tremendous advantage of this, one of the limitations is that really only a fraction of our patients uh, go on to angiography uh, following uh, nuclear perfusion imaging. And I can bias our results to um, those that are, you know, probably higher risk. So we've taken um, a little bit of a different approach, and this work was done um, in collaboration with um, our colleagues uh, at MITRE. Um, I have to um, <clears throat> say a big thank you to uh, Dr. Masana, who uh, linked uh, the Heart Institute together with um, scientists at MITRE, which is a a U.S. Um, non-for-profit think tank, um, as well as Dr. Liu um, and the uh, Biomed Group, uh, who has uh, set up uh, here in Ottawa a high-performance computing um, system with the help of, uh, of Pascal Terrio. Uh, and we have, you know, been taking advantage and, and using this uh, collaboration re really as a learning uh, experience to try and um, help us accelerate our work uh, in this area. So because we don't have angiography um, in you know, all our patients, maybe only 10 to 15%, uh, initially we looked at whether we could use, in fact, just the clinical reports uh, as our training standard uh, and see could we train a network to diagnose uh, either normal versus abnormal um, or, and also to localize uh, disease, a scar or ischemia uh, in each of the three coronary vessels. So uh, we've took uh, a sample of, uh, of 3,000 um, uh, PET scans with myocardial blood flow 
uh, only used as the uh, data input and the output as uh, either abnormal or normal or scar ischemia in one of the three vessels. Um, it's kind of the distribution uh, of our uh, training cohort. There was, uh, you know, on the order of, uh, you know, 10 to 15 percent of patients with scar or ischemia in one or more of the three vessels and overall uh, normalcy rate of about 50 percent, uh, which is a good distribution. You want to, in general, have good coverage uh, or representation of normal and abnormal in your different training classes. Uh, following the methodology that I kind of showed briefly in the MIN review paper, uh, we divided our data set into training sets and uh, validation. And here's the kind of internal loop for tuning different models of the traditional machine learning or the deep learning parameters, uh, and then an evaluation or holdout set uh, for evaluation of the model accuracy. Uh, in fact, we have an additional holdout set uh, that we'll use to choose eventually between either traditional or one of the uh, AI methods. And this work has been um, performed um, by uh, Dan Berman at MITRE uh, together with Chad Hunter uh, here uh, in Ottawa and Jason Yao uh, was a med student who did uh, all of the manual uh, parsing of these clinical reports and Alan Gear Hossein who uh, was our expert for the you know, traditional statistical methods. And what we see here um, were a combination of um, expected and some unexpected results. Uh, for the detection problem, where we would like to classify patients as either normal or abnormal, um, we actually evaluated um, almost all uh, of the um, traditional methods, logistic and lasso linear logistic regression with some of the machine learning and deep learning uh, algorithms. Uh, and they're color coded here. So for detection, we can see that the green, the green and the blue had substantially better performance than kind of purple and red. And these were You can just reshare your screen. Are you still there? Uh, yeah, we can see you, but the, not the, the screen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Is that back? Yeah, that is good. Perfect. Okay. So uh, improved performance <clears throat> for detection. Uh, so uh, area under the curve, you know, greater for the machine learning, deep learning methods compared to traditional logistic regression. Um, but when we look at localization, where we um, divide the problem up into um, scar and ischemia in each of the three vessels, we actually see very little uh, difference in performance. Um, and this is uh, somewhat surprising, but um, you know, our interpretation is that when you have uh, you know, a well-defined problem uh, with input data that relates strongly to the output data, then in fact, the, log the traditional logistic regression methods um, can do just as well as uh, machine learning method. Um, interestingly, um, there were some potential differences in the right coronary artery, uh, which is um, sometimes an area that's um, uh, impacted by more uh, clinical motion and can be a bit harder to interpret. Uh, in fact, the deep learning method had worse performance. Uh, you can see ROC area under the curve of 0.88, which was significantly lower than um, even the traditional logistic regression. Um, but uh, machine learning, in this case, random forest, seems to be um, consistently uh, uh, high performance, both for the localization and the detection task, which would be our choice um, for uh, deployment moving forward. Uh, and finally, um, quickly, um, you know, I mentioned that Jason Yao uh, kind of manually abstracted, um, you know, 3,000 reports for that program. Um, this is a challenge, um, you know, to get good training data uh, for the imaging applications. Uh, so another MITRE scientist uh, working together with uh, Chad Hunter, Emily Workman, um, 
developed uh, a natural language um, processing pipeline to extract um, the important information uh, out of our structured PET reports. Uh, and in this case, we have, you know, fortunately, a structured line typically with opinion, which is normal abnormal, that can be uh, identified quite robustly. Uh, and then in terms of the perfusion distribution, we're interested in ischemia uh, and or scar uh, in the different territories. And here's where uh, things can be a bit more challenging because although we use a structured report template, the language used by uh, different staff and fellows uh, can be quite variable. Uh, so Chad and Emily uh, developed this uh, uh, structured language model uh, where we identify different grammatical components uh, and different operators to link those components, uh, in, in, including you know, identification of uh, you know, large or small scar or ischemia or what we call negation or some cases where there's no large scars or no ischemia. Uh, and this uh, is not a simple uh, process to abstract this data reliably. But what we found, uh, what Chad has found, processing uh, 16,000 uh, pet reports going back uh, almost to 2007, uh, that these can be really reliably abstracted with you know, 98 to 99% accuracy. Uh, and I think this means that we can use this data reliably uh, as our training standard uh, for our imaging applications going forward. Uh, I'm going to leave you with one last um, uh, application. This is not our work, uh, but shows the potential uh, of what AI is going to be bringing, not only to pet imaging, but to other imaging modalities as well. This is uh, a convolutional neural network, uh, more complex than what I've shown, so-called UNET, um, uh, where we have images as input uh, and hopefully better quality images uh, as output. Uh, what they were able to show uh, was with ECG gated images. Um, these were their training standard images, would be an end diastolic uh, image together with CT, uh, giving the trained network data from only 1% uh, of the raw counts, very noisy image, or 10% was able to produce images um, that could be used to uh, measure accurate volumes. And so even with you know, one to 10% of the input, i.e. the dose could be reduced, you know, to 10% or 1%, uh, we would still be able to get out accurate estimates um, of LV ejection fraction and volumes. Um, and so this is um, absolutely amazing to me, and we hope to be able to uh, investigate similar things and, and improve our uh, imaging performance even further as time goes on. Um, we have a, a proposed network that we're looking at together with uh, Jubal and Draxamash, where we'll combine clinical variables with images, develop AI models, uh, and hopefully uh, expand our diagnosis, not only uh, of coronary disease, which has been the focus in our field so far, but uh, non-ischemic cardiomyopathies, microvascular disease, and the so-called NOCAs, uh, as well as uh, traditional um, prognostic risk stratification. So that I will thank you. Uh, of course, uh, none of this is, is my work um, done in isolation. And I have um, to thank uh, my clinical colleagues and collaborators, of course, most importantly, Rob Beanlands, um, Ron Klein, uh, Jennifer, who, who developed a lot of the technical methods, uh, Terry Ruddy, uh, my other colleagues uh, in nuclear cardiology who've uh, supported me over the years. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, uh, Rob. This is just an unbelievable uh, journey. And uh, this is uh, fantastic in terms of, uh, you know, all those uh, historical pictures. Oh, this is just absolutely amazing. And uh, of course, the amazing images that uh, the new scanners are able to bring forward. And uh, of course, you know, all the work that has been taking place uh, in between, uh, just uh, simply outstanding. You know, so, and of course, your work really uh, uh, transform the field, but always, you know, maintain on the front, uh, uh, on the front uh, cutting edge. And uh, so, you know, including the uh, most recent AI work, I really like the fact that, you know, you really take it, uh, but uh, very objective about it. And uh, so, you know, uh, like uh, two, two scientists rather than the clinician types. And uh, 
Um, so uh, I don't know if there are questions, uh, you know, in terms of uh, um, uh, Rob uh, Robinez. Uh, so um, uh, Rob has his hands up, uh, but also comment from Ross uh, Davis, you know, uh, just uh, commenting on your excellent uh, update, uh, great uh, presentation. Yeah. Thank so, you very much, Ross. Glad you could yeah. join. Yeah. So I don't know if uh, Rob uh, Binance uh, is able to. Can, can you? Uh, yeah. So ask the question you, directly. Um, yes. Go ahead. Can you hear me or see me? Yeah. I can uh, hear you. We, we can't see you, but uh, we can hear you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so congrats, Rob, uh, and congrats on uh, uh, the your the Bloomgard Award earlier, plus all this fantastic work. Um, I think I now understand how the new scanner works. Um, and uh, uh, the, the black box of AI is now just a little bit grayer. So um, appreciate that very much. Um, I just really, um, a perspective. Um, I think the AI work, especially to, as you showed, to improve image quality, potentially improve diagnosis. I've been, Maybe it's because I I feel the promise is so high. I've always been. It does show to be a little bit better, but not as much better as I might have thought. Um, and so, basically, to get your perspective on that, number one, and then how you see it being used. They say now, you know, it shouldn't. We shouldn't think of AI as replacing, rather, it being you know AHI, augmented human intelligence. So how you see it being used uh, in the clinical realm going forward? Um, and then related to that, how, how far are we off from that? So sort of three questions uh, rolled into one. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, even the work by uh, Gilks Lomka's group at, at Cedars you know, shows some marginal benefits. And I think that's really, to me, that means that, um, you know, the expert clinical readers uh, are very experienced. Right. I mean, they do know um, how to see those patterns uh, in, you know, the images that they've been reading often for decades. Um, the small number, you know, that the machine is helping to identify, um, I think, are potentially those cases that are that are more difficult. Right. And those may be interpreted as, you know, maybe possibly normal or possibly abnormal. Um, there's a recent paper has just come out uh, from their group, which I did not show, um, you know, showing again, if you present the machine learning uh, interpretations to the expert readers, that also helps to improve yeah. the accuracy. Um, so uh, that, that's, um, I think, the answer to the initial question. Um, sorry, second was what? That, that. That was it. Like how we how we augment, um, um, how we use it to augment accuracy and so on. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. So I think yeah. How far on, away? On that point, and how far away is that? Right. And so I think now we have models that are, you know, static. They've been trained, and then they could be deployed. Right. Um, I think what will be the next iteration and what would be more helpful, and I think the long term vision of many is that the models would continue to learn based on the continued update of the expert readers. So, you know, um, you may be able to save time uh, and, and have the trained algorithm, um, you know, provide a, uh, an initial interpretation. And, and if that confirms your um, initial view, that might help speed up your reporting and maybe save you time or let you allocate some time to spend on those more difficult cases. Uh, and if those could be then cycled back into a continuous learning um, algorithm, then in theory, it should improve over time. Um, and I think that that would be you know, my hope uh, for algorithms in the future that um, you know, the machine helps you, uh, saves you time with the simple cases and lets you spend time on the more difficult cases and in turn feed that back into the training set uh, so that uh, the system can learn from your, you know, accelerated experience. So the, so the computer needs continuous education just like we do. 
in 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 theory, then it should improve as your yeah. experience improves. Then you know you would like it to improve as well. It doesn't have to. If you only train it once uh, and you move on from that, then it's not going to improve. So you have to put that in place. Yeah. But I think you know with the beautiful new images, you know that's certainly the algorithm needs to be retrained. Or, but of course, you know when you have such beautiful signal noise, you know the contribution of AI gets smaller and smaller, right? And uh, so, and also has some implication for training uh, trainees as well. You know, I think uh, the AI can help in terms of training the trainees, but it must be avoided in terms of. Uh, the trainees gets lazy, you know, and they just use the AI to read it. They don't bother to actually figure out what's really you know, behind the images. But I mean, you, you can think about, I mean, it's not really uh, applicable for PET because PET is, you know, mostly available in, in uh, you know, academic institutions, but, you know, for other uh, imaging yes. applications yes. like like ECHO, for example, yeah. if you can take, you know, the experience of a, of a you know, 40 year uh, experienced radiologist yeah. and provide that to a remote community, like that would be tremendous, right? Yeah, yeah. Also, I mean, you, you, we've seen that if evolution, even in just in clinical medicine, you know, people right. yeah. were outstanding oscillatory clinicians that could listen to the heart and get pretty good accuracy. Probably not as accurate with our ears now because we have echo, we have technology that's advanced. And I, and I would see this as, like you say, yeah. allowing one to spend time on other things, or like you say, the more difficult cases, um, uh, especially when, when a lot of the work can be done by, by the computer uh, when it's a straightforward case. Yeah. Um, yeah, great, 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 very exciting, very exciting. Great. Yeah, so, uh, so yeah, so thanks uh, both Robs and uh, sorry, I, I, you know, I, I have uh, tons of questions, but I guess I'll reserve the, you know, ask Rob on a separate occasion. I just realized the time, the hour has flown by. And yeah, uh, sorry. You know, oh, no, no, no. It's a great, uh, great presentation, fantastic work and uh, uh, so educational, but uh, yet uh, at the level, you know, in which, uh, uh, you know, clinicians can understand. Uh, but while, you know, sort of uh, understanding the, uh, you know, exciting, uh, uh, I think uh, the new frontiers that the actually is uh, going to offer and uh, certainly, you know, like to explore those uh, with you uh, down the road as well. Yeah, so I just like to uh, take this opportunity to actually thank uh, uh, Dr. Rob DeCamp and, uh, you know, sort of for all the amazing work he's done and uh, his uh, contributions. Uh, you know, in addition to the wonderful lecture today. And thank you very much for joining us on this occasion as well. So take good care, everybody, and uh, see you uh, next week. Uh, it's Jason Adrat uh, on the, uh, uh, on the uh, uh, new uh, insights on atrial fibrillation. It's one of these occasion rounds. Take care. Bye-bye.